The End of Time Review The philosophy of history is a domain of thinking that has always, to some degree, found itself amenable to theological intervention. And thus the fact that Joseph Piper, a proponent of the ancient wisdom, has given a modern rendering of the Christian narrative should come as no surprise. The main question that his book, The End of Time, wants to answer, or rather pose, is how does history and the temporality in which it is intertwined look under the guise of its end? Piper wants to give an analysis of history in light of its telos and its terminus. But how is this investigation supposed to begin? First, there must be an acknowledgement that history is distinct from the sheer happenings of the past. The lightning bolt in the sky and rock tumbling to the ground is a happening, though not a part of history. The philosopher of history then is not concerned with sheer happenings, though he must know something of what has happened, but with the internal logic and connection of events and what they might mean. The philosophy of history is thus the hermeneutics of the past. But since we know that history is the hermeneutics of the past and the chief question to be investigated is the end of history, both in terms of its goal and terminus, then the question arises, what philosophical framework is best suited for this investigation? The answer that Piper gives is that this philosophy of history must be rooted in or closely intertwined with theology. Why so? Because the question of the end of history is a question introduced with force by the Judeo-Christian tradition. The Greeks held to a cyclical theory of time, and thus there was no fulfillment or directionality to it. To speak of progress is to already be within the discourse established by Christian theology. What is more, many philosophies of history that are dependent upon a pre-established view of both the start of history and its end are based upon this knowledge breaking into history which would seem to presuppose some sort of revelation in the reflective study of its contents, that is, theology. Now, though it is the case that history is a hermeneutic enterprise grounded in certain theological presuppositions, it does not follow from this that history is simply the inevitable unfolding of the divine plan. The determined path of natural occurrences are not to be identified with historical processes. Quote, the concepts associated with the essential nature of history are freedom, decision, uniqueness, unrepeatability, uninterchangeability, unpredictable capacity for variation, the individually solitary. Close quote. Because of the element of spontaneity that is intrinsic to history, there can be no true predictions of historical events, not by robust statistical model or via theosophical astrology. But while there can be no prediction of historical events, there can be prophecy. Prophecy is different from prediction insofar as its insights are not grounded in expectations related to patterns that have already been experienced, but instead is grasping hold of the spontaneous domain of history itself and thus cannot be foretold from any empirical fact. Additionally, the question of if history has an end cannot be answered within the domain of the imminent sphere of sociological analysis. One must accept the possibility of apocalypse first, and from that acceptance the understanding of the possibility of historical end can come into view. This requires faith, however, but faith in the existential, Kierkegaardian sense of the word. Faith is utter commitment and perpetual renewal thereof. The idea of the end of history in the sense of the termination and extinction of the whole of humanity is rooted in a nihilism that was created by Christian philosophy. The concept of nothing, the sheer lack of any existence at all, is linked to the Christian doctrine of creation ex nihilo. This nihilism assumes every end of culture, of history, of the human person, leads towards nothingness. This nihilistic view of history the view that either history has no goal or telos, or that the termination of history will inevitably miss its goal, that is, the view of history as futility,
is not the view that Piper endorses. The view of history Piper holds and the end of time intertwined with it is the fulfillment of history in which there is no time or history any longer. The end of history in the sense of telos or goal is the participation in the eternal now of classical Christian theology. Subsequently, the author looks at the theory of historical progress proposed by Kant and subsequently analyzes the idea of the Antichrist. I will not give a summary of either of these two portions of the text, since the commentary on Kant, though interesting, does not add much to the central argument, and the part on the Antichrist is less a part of the philosophy of history and more of the eschatology of last things. With exegesis complete, I will analyze the substantive theses of the text. Piper's book is in the philosophy of history, and thus his work is in a rich tradition that I will say a few brief remarks about. The philosophy of history can be divided into the substantive portion, which concerns questions like the following. Does history have a goal? Is there a direction that history is moving towards? Are there patterns of civilizational confluence and decline, etc.? Additionally, there is the area of philosophy that for goals first order questions about the ontological structure of the, or a, historical process and normative questions about its goal or hermeneutic questions pertaining to its meaning. Instead, the questions ask are what kind of knowledge, if there is such a thing, is historical knowledge? How should we understand the structure of historical events? Are there laws of history analogous to laws of the natural sciences, etc.? Questions about the direction of history and its metaphysical structure belong to what is sometimes called the speculative philosophy of history. The domain of philosophical investigation concerning our knowledge of history is sometimes called the critical or analytic philosophy of history. Piper stands in the tradition of speculative philosophy of history alongside thinkers such as Augustine, Marx, Hegel, Tonby, and on some readings, the later Heidegger, though he denies the name metaphysics to the speculation that he is engaged in. Piper takes it that those who engaged in theoretical investigations adjacent to history did so either as cultural sociologists or in the case of the early Heidegger in his philosophy of historicity as philosophical anthropologists. There are some penetrating points of insight in the text, especially on the idea of prophecy and the insight propounded by others but given an interesting twist here that to speak of progress is to already presuppose an end in the sense of a telos and that no empirical evidence can be given that one's goal is attainable. That is, for one to talk of progress in the general sense is to talk in a covert or confused way about the progress towards some state of affairs which embodies some set of values, such as freedom. But no empirical analysis can determine whether a given condition that embodies the values can come about. And thus the idea of progress, like the idea of the Christian story of Revelation, is based on faith. Or rather, the doctrine of progress is nothing but secularized eschatology. Quote, whoever says historical development has already said in thought that history possesses an irreversible direction. This applies all the more to anyone who says progress. Close quote. Still, despite the insights, there are problems here. First, how are we to reconcile the fact that history is supposed to be the interplay between free creatures on the one hand and an established divine plan on the other? The problem of foreknowledge appears in the text. Then, of course, there are the problems intrinsic to Revelation itself. If Revelation is, in principle, the kind of knowledge that we can only receive through external means and cannot come to know through reasoning alone, then the question arises of how we can ever know that revelation is actually a revelation, since there is no external method or process to ensure its validity. A speculative philosophy grounded in theology perhaps needs a critical theology all its own. Despite conceptual issues, this is a true work of philosophy, erudite, unshackled by positivistic concerns and daring. A great introduction and distillation of the old and wisdom often forgotten.